both common to the Jewish belief and the Christian belief is that the life that we know when we die we will be resurrected and there's what we call salvation. The Jews believe that the salvation is based upon their obedience to the law. Christians believe it's based upon belief in Jesus as Christ. What is the basis for the Muslim belief in salvation? Uh, if what you said is correct, that the Christian belief is in believing Jesus as the Christ, we have the salvation because we believe that Jesus is the Christ. We believe that. But no, I think you fail to say that you believe that he died for your sins, that he paid the price. Your salvation is God through the blood of Christ, that he paid the supreme sacrifice with his life. I think that is what you had in mind. Now, that topic... The subject, while I was reading the index, if you remember, I said, Christ Jesus not crucified is another topic. I've had debates with Christian you know, evangelists, Americans, evangelists on this topic, like a Floyd, Professor Floyd e. Clark from Johnson Bible College. I had a debate with him in, uh, uh, in, in, in the Royal Albert Hall, London, last year. I had another Professor Simpkins, you know, also an American, he came to South Africa, we debated with him, was Christ crucified, as well as is Jesus God? How about the crucifixion? So we say Jesus Christ was not killed, nor was he crucified. This was a subject of debate last night with Dr. Robert Douglas of the Zwemer Institute. He's the director of the Zwemer Institute, a missionary organization in this country. I had a debate with him last night. And I think that tape, as well as the videotapes are available, you can, you can avail yourself of those. How does the Muslim get salvation? You see, to Muslim there's only one way. And the way is for all eternity the same. There is no change. God is not the author of confusion. He wouldn't tell Moses something and he gives something contradictory to Jesus and again something to contradict him to Muhammad. If it is all coming from the same source, the message must be the same. His law is eternal and it is not changeable. He doesn't change his laws by the minutes. He fails one system, then he introduces another system. That is not my God. He doesn't fail with this system. He gave to Moses and to the children of Israel a law. The law was that as you sow, so you will reap. In the book of Ezekiel, chapter 20, we are given that in a nutshell, which is truly Islamic. It says, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. And the Christian puts a full stop. All his literature, his evangelical literature, he stops there, puts a full stop where there's no full stop. He says, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father. Father Adam, he sinned. We, his children, are not responsible for what he did. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father. Neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. His sons today, in Los Angeles, last June, this previous June, 300,000 sodomites, whom you call gays, they gathered in San Francisco on a pilgrimage led by 50 lesbians on motorcycles. Here in San Francisco in your country, God Almighty will not ask Adam and say, hey, look at your children, this rubbish. What have you produced? No, God will not ask him. He's not responsible. He says, the righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him. Whatever good thing the good man does, he gets his reward. And the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. Whatever the evil monger does, sinner does, he gets his punishment. Salvation. How do you get salvation? It continues. The verse continues. But if the wicked will turn, means repent, from all the sins that he has committed and do that which is lawful and right, he shall surely live. He shall not die. Spiritually. Physically, we all die. The good and the bad. The sinner and the saint. We all die. But this die means... Spiritually, you will not be destroyed. You will live forever. That is salvation. You repent of your evil, do that which is lawful and right. Whatever God told you to do, you do. Heaven is for you. Solomon the wise, he tells us in the book of Ecclesiastes, advising his son and through him advising us. He says, and further, by this my son be admonished. Learn a lesson from this of making many books to end all your excuses for not doing the job, not doing the work, not obeying God. There's no end to your excuses. Of making many books, 
there is no end. And much study is the weariness of the flesh. You know, you say, I'm going to study Buddhism, I'm going to study Taoism, I'm going to study Judaism, I'm going to study Islamism, and I will come to a conclusion. He says, you'll get tired. He says, and much study is the weariness of the flesh. He says, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter in a nutshell. Let's get the message. He says, fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. That's all. Fear God and keep his commandments. That is salvation. Jesus Christ told you the same. He says, Very, verily I say unto you, most certainly I'm telling you this, except your righteousness exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, ye shall by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. There is no heaven for you unless you are better than the Jew. Except it exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, ye shall by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. He said again, think not that I am come to destroy the law of the prophets. I am come not to destroy but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, most certainly I'm telling you, heaven and earth shall pass away, but one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law. Tittle, jot, jot is the smallest letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Not even that amount is to go out of the law of God. So one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments, least commandments, or shall teach men so, shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall teach and do, shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. I say, we teach and we do. I ask you, do you keep the laws and the commandments? You say, no. I say, why not? He says, the law is nailed to the cross. Why not? He says, we are living under grace. That's what the Christians say. You're living under grace. I say, where did you get this? This idea that the law is nailed to the cross is done away with. Where did you get it? So he quotes me, Philippians, Galatians, Corinthians, Thessalonians, Colossians, and so who's this? Who's this? Timothy, Romans, who's all this? What's this? Who is that? He said, Paul, 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 Paul. I said, who's your master? He said, Jesus. What does he say? You're contradicting Jesus. And Jesus said, the disciple is not greater than the master. Master is Jesus. What he tells you, I say, I listen to my master, Jesus. He never had the pig. He, none of his disciples ever touched that pork. You call it pork, ham, bacon, whatever you call it. He never touched that stuff. None of his disciples ever touched it. And you are all pig eaters. Christians. Where did you get this? He said, Peter had a dream. On that dream, now you eat pigs. When my master never ate it, he wouldn't eat it. It was abhorrent to him. He killed 2,000 pigs, one hit. He destroyed them all. You know that? But now you don't listen to him. You are now living in the graves. I said, are you circumcised? He says, no. I said, why aren't you? No, it's a major commandment. God gave. Your Lord was Christ. Jesus Christ was circumcised. I said, what is good for your God should be good for you. No, you won't circumcise. Why won't you? This is the law of God. It entered into between Abraham and his descendants forever. And you claim to be spiritual descendants. How does that absolve you? It is Jesus was circumcised and you are not. He said, no. He says, Paul said, circumcision, circumcision is nothing and non-circumcision is nothing. I said, Jesus says, not even one jot or one tittle is to pass from the law. Can't you see? You are not following Jesus. You're following Paul, Paul, Paul. He is the real founder of Christianity. Paul, not Jesus. Therefore, your great countryman, Michael H. Hart, he wrote a book on the top hundred, the greatest hundred in history, the most influential hundred people from Adam to current time. And he gives us a list. The hundred, the top hundred, or the greatest hundred in history. Michael H. Hart, New York, of the Hart Publishing Company. And in that list of the most influential men, after giving the list of hundred names, he puts them in the order of seniority. Number one, number five, number fifty, number ninety-nine, who, who, who? And he put Muhammad number one. The most influential man in history, according to Michael H. Hart, an American, in America, publishing a book of 572 pages, retailing about 10 years ago for $15, which I paid for it. Maybe it cost 50 today. I don't know. He says, Muhammad is the most influential man in history. And his Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, number three. His God and Savior, number three. And he gives reasons. Not because some Arab bribed him. So here's 10,000 for you. Say a good word about Muhammad. Put him number one. We give you 100,000. Put him number one in your book. No. No Arabs could ever think of that. It's possible but not probable for an Arab to do that. 
Why does he put Jesus Christ as God and Savior number three? He said, you see, the honor for Christianity is to be shared between Paul and Jesus. Actually, Paul is the real founder of Christianity. Listen. Just follow Jesus. Listen to him. You can't help being a Muslim. You'll be a Muslim through and through. But you don't want to listen to Jesus. Read the books. Listen to the sermons. It's Paul, 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 not Jesus. What did Jesus say? He says, he is not of me who does not take his cross and follow me. Take up your cross and follow me. But the cowards that we are, we are not prepared to pick up the cross. 